Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by African-American fantasy author and horse lover, Pamela Lawson. Pamela is originally from Talladega, Alabama, but she now lives in Northern California. She loves to ride horses, and she embarked on a career change at the age of 55. So we're going to be talking to her about what it's like to be a Black fantasy author, her favorite type of horse, how she got into horse riding, and anything else she would like to talk about. So, Pamela, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Why don't you start off telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Okay, I'm going to go way back because it will give people a chance to see who I am and how that influenced the story that I wrote. As mentioned previously, I was born and raised in Talladega, Alabama. I have two sisters and our parents died in the same year when I was 11. Before they died, however, my mother instilled in me my love of reading and also my love of horror. We would stay many nights watching creature features. Uh, we would unroll the bed couch or the, I guess people say sofa bed these days. And we would just watch those movies all night. And I don't know what it was. I Something marked me because I have loved horror ever since. And so after... My parents died. We had an aunt who was kind enough to take all of us in rather than separate us. And so we attended the de facto segregated school that was in the community. And I had a cousin who went to UC Berkeley. And one summer, our relatives would fly us out to California every summer to give my aunt and Talladega a break. So this cousin took us on the Berkeley's campus and I just fell in love with the whole culture and didn't look at any other university when when it came time for me to apply for college. And so my sisters followed suit. We all went to UC Berkeley, settled in California. I wanted to be a forensic pathologist for years, ever since I was a child. I was that weird child who, when we walked up and down the road and there was roadkill, I would go over and see what had happened, you know, see if the if there was bloating that day or or if it was now flat from the cars running over it, whereas my sisters would stay as far away from those corpses as they could. So I was always that weird child. I think I was a weird black girl before they wanted to turn weird black girl. In fact, at my father's funeral, I remember asking the funeral director about the embalming process. And he looked at me and he was like, well, and then he proceeded to explain it in a way that was appropriate for an 11-year-old asking about her father. So those things influenced me. Once I got to Berkeley, I discovered I did not like math or science. So I majored in anthropology and it was during my last semester. I was taking a medical anthropology class and these little perky TA students asked us to envision the world. And this was in late 1980s. And so at that time, they were in the stage of cure for AIDS was about to be found. And so I'm sure everybody else wrote these great stories about how people were cured. Oh, no, not me. I wrote a story about how the scientists captured homeless people. And this was before, you know, people became so politically correct, but they captured homeless people and injected them with a substance and that turned them into creatures. And so I was surprised when I got an A on the paper and with a note saying I should turn it into a screenplay or a novel. I did nothing because at the time I was still invested in doing something in the forensic world in some capacity. So the years went by 
I did write at that time. When I was a child, my grandfather knew of my love for writing. And so he got me a Shetland pony. I still remember the name. The name was Mitch. And people think Shetland ponies are all these cute, gentle creatures. They are not. They are ornery. This pony bucked me off every time I got on him. So my father gave him away to a family that had 10 or 11 children. So that was my little experience with horses. But after I became an adult and I was working a variety of jobs, I mean, I've done everything, administrative assistant, x-ray tech, ultrasound tech. My sister started taking lessons. Before that, she was riding in the Oakland Hills with the Black Cowboys in Oakland. And so I didn't go down there again and ask, you know, to join them. But she started writing at a barn here in the Sacramento area. And that was it. I was involved. I signed up for lessons and I have been writing ever since. So when you write your books, you incorporate the South. So tell us about incorporating your your roots in, in the South and what you think about as a writer when you're creating your stories. You know, when I first wrote the story, I didn't really set out to write the story that it ended up. I just knew that I was going to write a story about these strong women. And how it came about is that I was at a family reunion in the Poconos and I fell. And while I was in lying in bed in pain in the hotel, while everybody was having fun, I started thinking, what if there were these women warriors who could shape shift into wear panthers and had to eat people? So when I returned to California, I was like a person possessed. So I wrote the story in about three months and Something, I don't know really what drove me to want to set it in Alabama. I just, sometimes I just get a longing, frankly, for the red dirt, not for that heat and humidity though, and but the red dirt in the landscape and the people and, and the community I grew up in. So I decided to set the story in a fictional town outside of Huntsville called Ravenswood, Alabama. And my Southern roots are evident all throughout the story. I have chapters where the women are gathered in the kitchen and they're cooking greens and fried chicken and fried fish, banana pudding, just all kinds of Southern foods. And in a way, it's, this story is a way to keep the memory people who have passed on alive. For example, one of the characters' name is Ciola. And that was the name of my my mother's mother. And it's a way for me to keep their memories alive and to hang on to my childhood. The story starts with women picking hook salad along the side of the road. And this is from a real memory. I was in the car with my mother and our sister one day, and my sister said, Margaret, wait a minute, that looks like poke salad. And so my mother slammed on the brakes and backed up. And sure enough, they saw poke salad and wild onions, and they got out of the car and picked it. And later they gave me a taste of the poke salad. I can't really tell you what it's like now, but that stayed with me all of these years, and it's in the opening scene of my book. Well, talk about what you feel about the importance of Black black writers writing their own story, especially in this time. And all that talk about food makes me hungry. Huh? Good good soul food. It is, but you know, I try to eat healthy now. But I grew up with people. My aunt kept the, what is that, that pork, salt pork under the cabinet, and she had put the salt over it. <laughs> I tried it once and all I got was rancid pork. But anyways, I feel it is so important for there to be Black writers in a lot of the genres. I am an avid reader and I rarely read books by Black people. I I do search them out, but there just aren't a whole lot out there unless in a certain genre. I don't read romance 
So I think that's probably where a lot of the authors are. But just in my dealings with fantasy, I have read books by white authors who have Black characters. I am a huge mystery thriller writer and several male writers have main characters who are Black. And so I thought, that's wrong. There are Black people out there who are writing good stories, yet people would never know. And so I... I know there aren't a whole bunch of Black female fantasy writers or speculative fiction writers, but it was important for me to to write this story and not conform to what people think I should write. So I feel there is an audience for the stories that I write and in the voice that I write. Well, tell us the people that influence your voice and what your voice is trying to say, you know, any musicians or writers, anybody that influenced you to do what you do and have a voice. That, you know, I would love to say Tony Morrison or Maya Angelou, but I read fantasy novels. And again, there aren't a whole lot of Black people. The person who most influenced my voice, believe it or not, is P.D. James. She was this British writer, and she wrote these series. They were shown on PBS. And what really struck me with her writing was the way she could delve into the psyche of her characters. But what I am not able to replicate, unfortunately, is her wisdom. She was old. I mean, older than I am. I mean, I'm old, but she was older. So, you know, she had all of this life experience. And and so the type of writing that I gravitate to is several types. There's Stephen King, there's uh, James Patterson and John Sanford who do the just, just the boom, 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 boom. You can read their book in one sitting. I love Walter Mosley's books, but unfortunately, I don't have, there's there's not a female Black author that I can cite as someone who influences my writing. So your book ends with a cliffhanger. Do you have any sequel or sequels coming I out to that sure book? I do. I have completed the first draft of Rogue Ravenisha. And I've titled the third Revenge of the Ravenisha, and hopefully the series will continue and there will be a reign of the Ravenisha, R-E-I-G-N. So I'm planning ahead here. I am putting it out in a universe that there will be sequels. Well, talk to us about your writing process. Tell us where you get your ideas and, and what your process is like when you go to create something. That's a good question because, again, I had no idea that I would end up writing this book. At the time, though, Black Panther was out. And so I know subconsciously I wrote about these Amazon warriors because of the warrior women in Black Panther. But I didn't want to to replicate the story of the true Amazon warrior women known as the Mino or Ahosi. So I decided to base mine on, I wanted to incorporate my love of of horror and and fantasy and weaving this make-believe world that could exist in the real world if people opened their minds. And so I thought about the story that I wanted to tell, the impact I wanted to have on people and how I wanted to portray Black women. And it was very important to me to show that, yes, Black women are often known as strong Black women, but that doesn't mean that we don't still have vulnerabilities or issues. So 
it was important for me to to fit all of that into a fantasy. I, I knew that I couldn't get too too deep into the political history, but as someone born and raised in Alabama, there was no way that I'd write a story that didn't focus on slavery, the civil rights movement, the even just every you know just on the events that have happened to black people in this country. And the issue was weaving the story together in a way so that it didn't just hit people over the head and have people going, oh, the book about slavery, the book about poor black people. And I didn't want to do that. And so that's why I have Queen Idea, who is the African Ravenisha as a woman of power, and she's also one of the villains. And I wanted to show that we come in all different different ways, and, and we're not all downtrodden. And I also wanted to add that fantasy element of the rare panthers. So here it kind of goes back to making them strong again. So there are these fierce women. They don't have any hesitation about killing and eating humans. What tell us about does your family support your your journey, your writing journey? Absolutely. My sisters have been so, so very supportive, especially one of my sisters, because she reads the same type of books. And so she's been on board from the very beginning. She has read so many of my drafts. And I'm so thankful. And even my my nephews and nieces, they're on board, but they're, you know, their advice has been really great as well because my nephew, when I asked him to read Rogue Brave Nation, he didn't read the first one. He said, How do you expect me to be sympathetic to these characters when they eat humans? And I was just thinking, oh my God. I grew up watching Dracula movies and I didn't care when, when Dracula sucked human beings dry. But he said he was not going to read the story or even feel anything for the characters until I made them feel some sort of empathy. <laughs> so, but you know what? I think that made the story better. But so my support has been, it's been varied. And I, I have had people in my family help me out with the technical aspect of getting the book formatted. And I have just friends on Facebook that everybody's been so supportive. Well, kind of tell us, you know, give us a rundown about your books and where people can pick them up and tell us about any upcoming or current projects that you're working on that we need to know about. Okay. The Rise of the Ravenisha is available, of course, on Amazon, but, you know, we like to try to support independent bookstores. So it can be ordered from a seat at the table here in Elk Grove. It can also be ordered from platforms such as Google Play, and it's available at a couple of other bookstores I believe Kindred Bookstore in Houston and the Silver Unicorn in Boston. But the main place I would look would be here in Elk Grove at a bookstore called A Seat at the Table. They can also go to my website for information. And I have buttons there that they can click that would take them directly to those to Amazon and to a seat at the table. My website address is www.pgrace. Lawson.com. And I do have a couple of events coming. I'm going to be at the, oh, I think it's Behind the Ink. They're having an event April 30th in Birmingham, Alabama. I think Zane will be the main speaker, but I will have a table there. And I'll be available also to sign books next day at Homecoming Bookstore, which is also in Birmingham. 
So you got any social media links? I do. Oh, but I'm not sure. You know, uh, that's going to be hard. Probably going to be found on your website, huh? (laughs) Yes, because I'm on Instagram and Twitter. You can tell, like, ooh, I am not a social media person, but I have people managing that for me. Oh, that's okay. If they search for P. Grace Lawson, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Gotcha. Close us out with some final thoughts. Talk about anything that maybe I left out that you want to touch on or just... Any final thoughts maybe for any African-American authors out there? I will do that. You might have to remind me about the final thoughts for African-American authors, but you did ask me about my favorite horses. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about that and why I felt it was important to, to put that also in my book. I Right now, I started out doing hunter-jumper lessons, but I'm a dressage writer now. I also do trail riding, Tennessee walkers, And it was important for me to make one of my main characters, Teddy, who's a new generation, be a dressage writer and also be versed in other disciplines, you know, like hunter jumper and and also going on trail rides. Because I really believe that it's something that everybody can enjoy. And writing is something that you can do when you're old. I mean, look at Queen Elizabeth. And when I used to go to the Hunter Jumper Barns, because that's where a lot of kids would be, as po- it's mostly old people at the Dressage Barns. But when I go to the Hunter Jumper, mothers will always say they know where their kids are. They drop them off at the barn. They there all day. And having to be around horses changes you. You learn how to take care of an animal. You learn how to respect an animal that is bigger than you. It makes, writing makes you be brave when you don't want to be brave. Just to me, it just really develops people's character. And so I wanted to put some scenes in my book so that black people could see, yes, there are people out there who ride. And while unfortunately equestrian sports is some of the most expensive sports. But if you just do trail riding or even Western, that is doable. And so my favorite horse used to be warm bloods, but now that I've gotten older, I have to be cognizant of my back. So I've kind of I'm kind of moving over to the gated horses, like the Tennessee walking horses. And thinking about looking at Lucy Tunnels and, and Delusions. And the last thing was to do, to say, it was something about the female writers. Yeah, any any African-American writer, you know, females, males, you have any yeah. final thoughts for them or any, any words yes. of encouragement? Yes, I do. And my words are of encouragement are, if you have a story within you, tell it. Don't be afraid. Writing, in a way, makes you be, oh, you learn about yourself and you either step up or you don't. It makes you be brave. I will tell a story. When I finished my first draft, I had a retired professor read it. She said she couldn't even read it because my tenses were all over the place. And it wasn't like I said things like they was or... I, I yields or something like that. It was more, I would say, oh, they were going to the store in one sentence. And then I would say, oh, they went to blah, blah, blah in another one. So that was my first indication that, oh, oh, this is not easy. And it's the first really hurt feelings because she was a college graduate and she felt like my writing was so bad. She couldn't even read it. <laughs> And she also questioned me on my what I had written about African religion. She said, I don't think what you've written is correct. So I was hurt for a little bit, but then I got back in front of my computer. I went through everything. I made my tenses all the same. And I did the research on the African religions. So I just want to encourage young people to, to, to write. 
And to not be afraid to let people see their work, to, to bear their souls to the world. Know that it's difficult and that they may not find an agent, but self-publishing has its advantages and disadvantages and that they can do it and that they can let their inner Ray Renisha warrior shine. Yep, ladies and gentlemen, pgracelawson.com. Please be sure to follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. And, you know, maybe Pam can encourage you to get into some horse riding. Android listeners, go download the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast app from that Google Play Store. Pamela Lawson, thank you so much for joining me today. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. Dream.